subtypes aren't really my thing. What is your thing then? Complex female characters. Complex female characters are my thing too. But actually, I think all females are complex. And non-females too. Humans are complex. We have memory. We can think. And we age. But why do any of these things happen? And do we become more or less complex with age? And can understanding complexity and modelling it with approaches from systems biology finally help us understand why we age and how we can stay healthy for longer? Well, let's discuss. I thought we'd begin with this paper I put in a thumbnail, Loss of Complexity and Aging by Lewis Lipsitz. This paper came out in 1992, so in my reference, it's an old paper, but it is still very relevant for today. Take a look at this first figure. It shows on the upper panel the normal sinus rhythm heartbeat at rest in a healthy 22-year-old female subject. The bottom panel is for a 73-year-old man. The heart rate for both of them is 64 beats per minute, yet the plots look very different. The younger female plot looks more chaotic, but to be fair, so does the older one, just less so. And that brings us back to the premise behind this article, potential applications of fractals and chaos theory to senescence. Senescence here referring to aging more generally, not cellular senescence, my favourite cell process. And so this paper essentially describes how these mathematical principles could be applied to create a new framework to understand, quantitate and model aging. We won't go too much into the math because, partly because it was never maths I was taught at university, and because it's not necessary to know what the math means to understand what it shows. It's kind of like a Christopher Nolan movie. Don't try to understand it. Okay, maybe it's not like a Christopher Nolan movie. But the two concepts are fractals, irregular complex shapes that have underlying patterns, and chaos apparently unpredictable behaviour that can arise from internal feedback loops of non-linear systems, a feature that seems to be apparent in many biological networks. An example of the loss of anatomic complexity of age shown in this paper is that of neuronal dendrites. Here, the branching of the dendrites is a measure of fractal-like complexity, and the age effect is a loss of dendrites and reduced branching. Now, these anatomic and functional slash physiological descriptions are all good and well, but they don't really inform us much on what is causing these changes to occur. Two rationales are that complexity is lost due to a loss of functional components and or altered non-linear coupling between these components. But what components are we really talking about here? Well, I mean, this article came out in 1992, so after all, is a valiant effort that I'm not going to, I'm not really going to criticise the paper for not finding out what these components are. Because frankly, a lot of things in the biology world have happened since 1992. I was born, we sequenced the human genome, we advanced technology in not just DNA sequencing, but RNA sequencing, pregeomics, chromatin structures, fancy microscopy techniques. Data outputs from these methods can range from thousands for gene expression to many, many more when it comes to quantifying microscopy images. So we now have a lot of data and tools that we can use to address these questions. But how do we make sense of all the data? Well, this is the goal of computational systems biology. Systems biology can be used to explain how complexity arises. I recently read the book, A Very Short Introduction to Systems Biology by Eberhard Foyt, a professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, a good primer for anyone interested in this field, and I'm going to use an example from the book to illustrate how systems biology can help. Some things can look complicated, but they're actually quite simple. That is, our brains can understand it. For example, this Rube Goldberg example looks complex, but if we just follow the linear series of events, we see that the movement of the man's hand causes the napkin to be lifted. Handy, right? But alternatively, simple things can be very complex. Let's start with an easy looking biological system. Let's say one with two components, A and B. Imagining that A and B are both genes and that they cave the proteins, we can see that when A is expressed, 
its protein product activates expression of itself and also the expression of gene B. And gene B, when it's expressed, inhibits expression of A. So if we begin with equal amounts of A and B, what would happen in this case if A is increased by 20%? Well, let's give some hypothetical examples. If we increase A, we might expect initially to see even higher amounts of A because A can activate itself, it self-reinforces. But A is also activating B, and so we might then see a decline. And then as A declines, there's less B activation, and so A increases and maybe it sort of oscillates in a pattern. Maybe this oscillation dies down, or maybe it goes on forever. Or maybe we just see A increase and reach a new steady state. Or maybe A goes to zero. Maybe B goes to zero. The point is, we don't know. And to quote from the book, the answer to these questions is disturbing. Only a mathematical model can provide true answers, and it needs information on the magnitudes of the production, the strengths of this activation and inhibition, and then this can be built into the model. But let's say it did oscillate. What is then causing the oscillation, if neither component can oscillate without the other? Well, this is said to be an emergent feature. Emergence can come then from seemingly simple systems that display unpredictable chaotic behaviours. Systems biology can help us understand them by formulating equations that define the system. Again, from three apparently simple set of equations, which trust me, although they look for non-mathematicians quite bad, they could be much worse. And if you start with different values of x, y and z, you end up with very different trajectories, and some of them can end up very complicated. Now, like with the heart rates we saw earlier, you might be thinking, why would biological systems employ such chaotic systems? Well, although the answer is not clear, as Lewis Lipset states, it seems it can enable an individual to adapt to the unpredictable changes of everyday life. But to know for sure, we really need to quantitate it with information we can understand. And so, coming back now to ageing, can systems biology be used to understand health and disease in complex humans? Well, we've already seen a rise in a number of consumer products more recently from personalised genetic testing, microbiome testing, sleep trackers, glucose monitors, epigenetic measures, and maybe on their own they do have some predictive value for disease risk or health estimates. But one idea that struck me from reading this short intro to systems biology was the idea of simulators. Now, the classic example of simulators you're probably aware of are flight simulators used to train pilots or for a fun family activity. These flight simulators, such as that of Boeing 737, can contain up to 367,000 parts, and it uses principles from physics to model what happens under different flight conditions. Pretty impressive. But the human body has 40 trillion cells, and each of these cells has its own molecular inventory of metabolites, proteins, lipids, you name it. And although research is actually being conducted to try and build human simulators, such as the Jump Simulation Centre at the University of Illinois, to revolutionise medical education, but if we did have such a model for a healthy human, we wouldn't really need that many parameters, and at least initially we would reduce the number of parameters to those physiological features involved in the specific disease case of interest. And so, for a healthy human, they would have parameter values within a normal range. This normal range accounts for interpersonal variations among healthy individuals. Sensitive parameters have small ranges, while insensitive parameters have larger ranges. If we pick any two parameters, the product of the ranges is a rectangle. Now, if we assume that extreme combinations are inconsistent with health, so you sort of truncate the corners, you end up with a polygon. And then if we add in all these other parameters, we end up increasing the number of dimensions of the polygon, and higher dimensions of polygons in mathematical terms is known as a simplex. So Foyt refers to this as a health simplex, which could also be thought of as a high-dimensional biomarker space. If you're within the health simplex, you're, well, healthy. And outside of it, 
unhealthy or in some transitional disease states. So it becomes nested. This is obviously a much lower dimension than it would actually be, but mainly for visualization purposes. And so the health simplex is surrounded by a larger simplex of transient unhealthiness, which could include conditions like a fever, dehydration. This simplex is then in turn surrounded by a disease simplex and then a morbidity simplex. So health and various disease states form nested simplexes. (laughs) Some distances between the subsequent simplexes may be short, others may be much longer and these distances could indicate the severity of a disease. And it could also be used to identify more important parameters or biomarkers that provide more value or indication for a disease risk. And so Foyt first presented this health simplex in 2009 in this paper. And he stated even then that the actual completion of the health simplex must be expected to take a very long time. But the thing is, even if the full simplex will not be available for some while, it will be feasible much sooner to to construct lower dimensional simplexes that focus on one particular disease and assume biomarkers in all other dimensions to be irrelevant or within their normal ranges. But I like the idea that we can think of ageing as therefore being a departure from our health simplex. And so simplexes with their quantitative characterization of many parameters could be used to create personalized health trajectories, health risk profiles that change with age and evaluate the efficacy of different treatment options. But we still don't have these health simplexes and it's also important to consider they are still built with many assumptions and the body we know can compensate for some changes And maybe a disease occurs only when the body can't implement such adjustments, which maybe we couldn't predict from the model. And so in that case, the health simplex is still very much a conceptual framework, but the framework could eventually become a means of qualitatively or quantitatively characterising risk profiles and suggest personalised preemptive measures of disease avoidance. It would therefore be interesting to know What is the smallest number of dimensions in a health simplex that would enable us to actually define health? And what would be the best and easiest measurements to make? I don't know the answers to these questions, but I do think this understanding is pretty interesting. And definitely, in my opinion, seems to be a good way to understand what ageing is. But that's just my perspective. What is yours? And I hope you've learned something in this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters and thank you for listening.